Hello, hello, and welcome to the first ever CS1332 Distance Learning Live Recitation. I'm Jacob, and I'm going to be your TA for the next 75 minutes while we do the best job we can to give you guys a normal recitation despite living countries apart. So, just some normal announcements before we get started today. Recitations are going to be at the normal Tuesday times, 4.30 and 6 o'clock, right here at this channel. Uh, won't be the same. I'm not going to be teaching both. Landon's going to be helping me out. We'll trade off from week to week which time slot we're doing. Uh, we encourage you to watch at the same time slot that your normal recitation is. So if you normally go to a 4.30 recitation, we encourage you to watch this one. If you normally go to a 6 o'clock, we encourage you to watch the next one. That's just to help break up the questions so that we don't have one recitation get flooded with a ton of questions. But if one time just works a lot better for you, you are free to watch whichever you want. If you really want to learn the information twice, you can watch both recitations, but we're always going to be covering the same information, so you're not going to like learn anything new by watching both of them together. We will be uploading these recitations afterwards. Um, YouTube did change the terms of service lately, so I can't use the fast way to upload everything, so it will probably take me around a day or two to get everything uploaded. We will post an announcement on Canvas once everything's ready, so look out for that. I'll also look to see if I can get them in the My Media section so you can view them directly on Canvas. But until then, you will be able to watch the VODs directly on Twitch. There should be a videos link kind of like right above my head there if you're not in full screen right now. Uh, and those VODs will stick around for two weeks, so if you need to watch it again tomorrow before they're uploaded to YouTube, you can always see it there. Um, the announcement gave detailed information on how you guys should be asking questions. You can either use Piazza, make sure to put your posts in the right folder, or you can send emails to these wonderful two TAs right here that are going to help me out get these questions to me so that I can answer them for you. Uh, I'll stop periodically to answer your guys' questions, but make sure that because there's some stream delay that you're asking your questions kind of as soon as you get them, because if you wait until I pause to ask your question, I'm not going to see your question until after I've started teaching again. So try to ask your questions as soon as you have them, and I will get to them as soon as I have the chance. Some more homework-related announcements. Your homework 8 has been extended. It's due March 30th. Homework 9 got released recently, and it's, out. it's going to be due April 6th. Uh, we'll announce more information about homework 10 later. But homework 9 will also have grade scope submissions set up very soon. We'll send an announcement about that, but you'll be submitting the same file to both places on Canvas and Gradescope. Now a little bit about today, since this is still the kind of test week of all the distance learning stuff, we're not going to be covering any new information, but there is some sorting stuff that we didn't get to cover in last week's recitation because it wasn't on your homework, and we're going to be talking about that today. So that's going to be going through selection sort, cocktail shaker sort, quick sort. We'll talk a little bit more about heap sort, and if you guys have any questions or stuff that you want me to cover, feel free to submit it in the ways we've asked you to, and we will get to your questions. With that said, going to go ahead and switch it over to my board. Let's go ahead and get start talking about selection sort. So selection sort is one of the more basic sorts. Um, basically how it works is every iteration of the sort, what we're going to do is we're going to pick, there's kind of two implementations. We're either going to pick the smallest element and move it to the beginning of the array, or we're going to pick the largest element and move it to the end of the array. And if we keep repeating this over and over again, we'll eventually end up with a completely sorted array. So this example I'm going to work through with you is going to be moving the smallest element to the beginning. So you can see I have my initial array here. You'll notice I do have duplicate elements, and we'll be using that to show stability. Uh, I'll try to show this as much as I can. I don't really have a lot of space to move around, so I am going to kind of cover up stuff while I'm writing, but I will try to move out of the way. So we need to look for the smallest element in this subarray. For that, we're going to need some element to start with. So that's going to be first element in our array. We're just going to say, OK, that's the smallest element. And until we're proven wrong, we'll keep it with that. So then we iterate over to 55. It's not smaller than 31, so we keep going. 76 isn't smaller. 69 isn't smaller. 26 is smaller. So that's our new smallest element. 31 is not smaller than 26. 12 is smaller than 26. Then 82 is not smaller than 12. So now we know what the smallest element in this subarray in this array is, and we can swap that element to the very beginning. So we're going to be swapping 12 and 31. And by putting the smallest element at the beginning of the array, uh, that's definitely the right place it should be. 
So we have 12 over here now, and our 31A over here. And the rest of the array remains unchanged. And now we know that this 12 is completely sorted. I can use a different marker to indicate that's completely sorted. Notice the 31s though. In the beginning of our initial array, we had 31A before 31B. And now in the second line, we have 31A over here and 31B over here. So they've swapped places. So that's kind of our indication that selection sort isn't a stable algorithm. It doesn't really matter what positions they end up in in the final array. If they swap relative ordering at any point, then we know our algorithm has to be unstable. So now we're going to do our second iteration. This time we don't start at the beginning of the array. We're going to start at that one spot afterwards, and we're going to look for our smallest element again. So 76, not smaller than 55. 69, no. 26 is. So that's our new smallest. Then 31 isn't smaller than 26. 82 is not smaller than 26. So we're going to swap 26 into the right spot. So before the right spot was index 0 of our array, now since we've kind of moved one iteration forward, it's index 1 of our array that we're going to swap it with. So can rewrite everything. Now we have a 26 here. And 55 over here. And is that a question? No, we're all good. So now, before we had one element that was sorted, now we have two elements that are correctly in their final positions. So we can keep going. We start with 76 as our smallest, 69 is smaller than that, 55 is smaller than that, 31b is smaller than that. Now we get to 31a. Now 31a isn't strictly smaller than 31b because they have the same number. So we're not going to move our smallest pointer over. We're going to keep it at this original 31b. Then 82 is obviously uh, not smaller than 31. So we know we can do this swap and end up now after three iterations. After three iterations, you can see that we have three sorted elements. And that's kind of one of the rules of selection sort. After i iterations that you've completed, the first i elements in your array will be in their correct sorted order. You'll notice we kind of have different versions of that for a lot of our different sort rules, but that's what it is for selection sort. So we'll keep going. 69 is our smallest, then 55, not 76. 31 is our new smallest, and that is our smallest. So we can swap 69 and 31a. And now we have these two 31s in their final positions. And you'll notice even in the final positions of the array, they did end up uh, at different spots with 31b before 31a. Next up, 55 is our smallest element. We iterate through the rest, nothing smaller. So now this is kind of an implementation detail if you want to just leave it in its correct spot or swap it with itself. We'll just give one red circle on it to indicate kind of nothing's going to happen. We end up with 12, 26, 31B, 31A, 55, 76, 69, 82. with these first five elements in their correct position. So, next iteration. We start at 76, 69 is our new smallest. So we're going to swap that one. And you can see that this is not a particularly fast algorithm. We'll talk about the time complexity in a second, 
but it definitely feels like this algorithm is taking a while, and that is true. Now, most of these things are in their correct sorted position. It's just these last two that we need to deal with. We start with 76 as our smallest element. 82 is not smaller than it, so we keep it at that. And it would swap with itself. And now once we're down to this last iteration, uh, you'll see that we know for a fact, since we've done seven complete iterations, that these seven elements are in their correct sorted order, and since there's only one element left and one kind of spot left, obviously 82 has to be in its correct sorted position. So we have to do kind of n minus one iterations across the whole array. And if we think about how long each iteration of took, uh, the first iteration we needed to look over the entire array. The second iteration it was kind of all but one element. So every iteration is essentially looking over n data roughly, and that's where we're going to get our time complexity. I'll talk about them a little bit more later probably, but selection sort is going to be O of n squared. And you'll note nothing in this algorithm at all kind of involved any pre-sortedness of this array. Even if our array was completely sorted, it just would have been a lot of elements that swapped themselves. So selection sort isn't an adaptive algorithm. Uh, even if we start with a sorted array, the process is going to be exactly the same. It doesn't matter if we're doing the min swaps or the max swaps, nothing's going to really change. So in our best worst average case, always O of n squared. So a lot of people tend to ask, why do we even have selection sort as an algorithm? It's this always O of n squared sort, which is a really bad time complexity for a sort to have. Well, one nice thing about selection sort is that we don't actually do that many swaps. You'll notice each one of these rows, we only did kind of one swap. It's all these uh, red circles. Um, versus like something like bubble sort, which does a ton of swaps every single iteration. So if you're working in an environment where writing to memory is a really expensive operation, but maybe like doing comparisons or checking things is really fast, then selection sort might be useful because you don't actually have to make that many swaps in selection sort compared to most of the other sorts. So it's not a completely useless sorting algorithm, even if it is a little bit bad. Another thing you'll notice, we didn't use any extra memory here. Everything was done in the array. So this is an in-place algorithm. And we already talked that isn't stable because these 31 A and B do switch at the end of our array. So I'll take a brief pause if there are any questions. None of them have been asked yet. Make sure we're all good. Yeah, I apologize if the webcam defocuses at any point. It is kind of auto-focusing. And it's most of the time staying on this board, but kind of when I walk in front of it or when I'm writing on it, it does get a little bit worse. So I will do my best to kind of stand away from it, make sure you guys can see what I'm writing. If there's any issues, definitely ask questions about it. TAs can 100% provide answers about stuff. Okay, haven't seen any questions yet. So we're gonna move forward into our next main sort, which is going to be cocktail shaker sort. So cocktail shaker sort, you've probably heard it talked about a couple times, but this is a sort a lot of people haven't seen before, before they go into kind of an algorithms class uh, or really start talking about sorts. It's really just a variant on bubble sort. It's not kind of any new fancy algorithm. All we're going to do is we're going to do one iteration of bubble sort going kind of forwards, the normal iteration. And then we're going to do a backwards iteration of bubble sort where we go all the way backwards. Because if you think about for bubble sort, uh, one of the really worst cases we could have had is an entirely sorted array with the minimum element just kind of sitting at the end of the array. Because then every iteration of bubble sort kind of only moves that element one spot backwards. So we need to do n iterations of bubble sort to sort the entire array, even though we start off almost completely sorted. And since bubble sort is an adaptive algorithm, that isn't really a good quality to have. So cocktail shaker sort is a variant that's going to fix that. 
by doing this backward iteration. So that will take that single element and move it all the way to the back. You'll see how that works. We are going to implement the last swapped optimization. It's the exact same thing you saw in uh, bubble sort, but I do want to stress that it is a last swapped optimization. A lot of people get mistaken and try to do kind of a first swapped optimization, but the only one that actually works is a last swapped optimization. We will implement that optimization in both directions, but it is always the last swap in any given iteration. Another bit of uh, language I want to specify is when I say one iteration of cocktail shaker sort, that is both of these steps. So one iteration of cocktail shaker sort is one forward bubble sort and one backwards bubble sort. So you'll see kind of, I have these two lines, those are both iteration one, and these next two lines are both iteration two. And spoiler alert, that's gonna sort our entire array because I don't really have more space. So let's start doing these comparisons. This first part is going to be a normal forward iteration of bubble sort. So that means we're gonna start comparing these two elements right here. There's no swap because 21 is less than 69. Then we compare 69 and seven. They do swap. So seven's gonna go here, and I can kind of remember that uh, I have a last swap that occurred kind of right here. This means I have kind of a floating 69 over here. That compares with six, it's less than it. So six goes here, I have 69. 69 is now less than 94, so 94 goes here. Our last swap doesn't move because we didn't make a swap. Then I have 94 and 34, those do swap. Ninety-four and forty-three swap. Ninety-four and seventy-eight swap. And then there's the only one spot in our array. So in this case, we don't really gain anything about out of our last swap optimization because it only our last swap was at the very end of our array. But when we start our backwards iteration, we can at the very least kind of ignore this last element because we know bubble sort guarantees that after the iteration of bubble sort, this last element in its correct place. So cocktail shaker sort after the first half iteration, we guarantee that the largest elements in its right place. And after the last full iteration, we'll also be able to guarantee the smallest items in its correct place. So let's start that backwards bubbling right now. We start by comparing uh, 43 and 78. Those don't swap, so I can copy this 94 down and I can copy this 78. Um, I'm going to circle this as swapped so I can keep using this uh, last swap pointer. So I only have one of those right now. So then I compare 43 and 34, those don't swap. 34 and 94 do swap. Sorry, that should be, this should be a 69. I apologize. That is my bad. Yes, uh, thank you, someone just asked that question. Yeah, this should have been a 69. Uh, that's entirely my fault. So 34 and 69 in this case do swap. I have my floating 34 here. And now our last swapped for the backwards iteration is here. 34 and six don't swap. Six and seven do swap. Six and 21 do swap. And six ends up here. And now we know that 94 is sorted and we know that uh, six is sorted. Since our last swap was between the six and 21 here, we don't gain any information out of our last swap optimization. So that's a little unfortunate, but we should get something during this next uh, iteration. So this is our one complete iteration of cocktail shaker sort. You can see, if, I, if it focuses a little bit better, that our smallest element is now at the beginning of the array and our largest element is now at the end. Is it gonna focus? Let's see if I can make it. All right, we'll keep going for now. It should fix itself. So this second iteration, it starts, we know that six and 94 are going to be right here. And we start with our forward iteration of bubble sort. So we compare 21 and seven and they swap. 
We compare 21 and 34, those don't swap. 34 and 69 don't swap. 69 and 43 do swap. Sixty-nine and seventy-eight don't swap, and seventy-eight's the last thing in our array. So now you'll notice that our last swap ended up here, not at the very end of our array. So now we can actually kind of make our optimization. We know this six is sorted from our first iteration. We know this ninety-four and seventy-eight are sorted because of our first half iteration and the part of this iteration. But we also know that this sixty-nine is in its correct place. So when we start our backwards iteration, instead of starting at 69, we can start by comparing this 34 and 43. So I'll copy down all the stuff that we know is sorted. And then we can start doing our comparisons again. 43 and 34 don't swap. 34 and 21 don't swap. Uh, 21 and 7 don't swap, and that leads us to the beginning of our array. So now since we've done any part of an iteration, uh, so now since we've done any part of an iteration, so either the forward pass or the backward pass, and we've gone without making a single swap, this indicates that our array is completely sorted. See, we have a question, where does the last swapped optimization pointer point? Does it point to the index in front of the swap or the index being swapped at? That's a great question. You'll notice that I kind of have been point, putting the pointer kind of in the middle of the two, and that's because you can really have it point to either one of them as long as your implementation handles that correctly. The big detail is that here, the last swap that occurred was between the 69 and the 43 right here, and that I put my last swap pointer here. So what I could do is I could put it on this element specifically, and then when I start my backwards iteration, I start kind of at that last swap to minus one or plus one if I'm going the other direction. Or I can uh, put the last swap pointer here on kind of the first element that was swapped. And then when I start my backwards iteration, I start at that index. It's really an implementation detail, but it'll be kind of one of those two elements. Great question though. So in this case, we've done kind of two iterations of cocktail shaker sort. There are long iterations, but it is only two iterations, and we managed to sort our entire array. Now, while you guys are potentially asking questions, I will uh, talk about the efficiency a little bit. Unfortunately, we're not going to actually do any better than uh, bubble sort in this sort because we're kind of just doing the same basic operations. This means that if we do have a completely sorted array, we can do the sort in O of n time. I don't really have a lot of space to write this stuff. I'm gonna try to put it up here. I know it's getting covered a little bit, but that's still seeable. So in the best case, we do have an O of n sort where there's no swaps that need to be made. We do one half iteration and completely sort the array. Uh, and the worst case and average case aren't going to be any better than bubble sort. I saw one question, I'll get to that in a second. So average or worst is O of n squared. So I saw the question of what is the advantage of the cocktail shaker sort over bubble sort essentially, which is kind of where it's used. So the advantage is going to be where we have, let me flip to a blank page for myself so I can show an example. So the advantage is going to be if we have an array that looks like this. So we kind of have all of the elements in order except for this one last element that's the minimum of our array. Now if we do bubble sort, what will happen is it'll be no swap, no swap, no swap, no swap, no swap, no swap. One swap at the very end. Then we do a second iteration. It'll be no swaps all the way until one more swap. And we'll have to do all n iterations, all of O of n squared work in order to completely sort this array. But if we do it using cocktail shaker sort, well, we'll do our first really bad bubble sort iteration and swap this a single time. Then we do our second iteration, or the second half of the first iteration, sorry. Uh, and when we do that iteration, it will swap the one all the way down to the beginning of our array. And then we'll be done immediately. 
So these are the kinds of situations where cocktail shaker sort is really useful. But if we have like a reverse sorted array or kind of some weird arrays that are like sorted on the outsides, then cocktail shaker sort does have really bad O of n squared cases. So it gives us a couple individual optimizations, but overall isn't a particularly better sort. Great question. So uh, some other stuff. Again, I've said this is an adaptable sort. We do get O of n in the best case. Uh, it's obviously in place because I haven't had to use any other data structures here, just the one array I'm working in. Uh, just like bubble sort, it's stable because I'm only doing swaps on adjacent elements, which means if I reach two adjacent elements and their duplicates, I can just choose to not swap those duplicate elements. And by not swapping them, that guarantees that any duplicates maintain their relative sorted order. Uh, and those are the efficiencies, so I will give you guys another minute or so to ask questions before we move on to quick sort. All right, nothing new yet. So now let's talk about quicksort. So you've already seen a lot of the algorithm that I'm going to be talking about today in the quick select algorithm, which you had to implement on your homework for the kth select problem. But quicksort is slightly different because obviously it's a sorting algorithm, not a kth select algorithm. But this partition algorithm is the exact same thing you've seen before. And just as a reminder, how partition works is we want to take some element, we want to figure out all of the things that are less than that element and all of the things that are greater than that element, put them to the respective left and right sides so that we're left with one element in its exact correct position in the final sorted array. How we do that is we start by randomly selecting a pivot. Remember that there's no kind of great way we can use to select a pivot that wouldn't just have some kind of worst case array. If we always select the first element, it's really bad for a reverse sorted array. If we always select the last element, it's really bad for a sorted array. Um, if we kind of try to pick the middle element every time, you can make arrays that that's really bad for. So really the best way we have to do it is randomly. It turns out that doesn't really affect our time complexity at all. Then what we're going to do is we have to swap the pivot to the front. That kind of gets it out of the way of the rest of the elements so that we know uh, it's a lot easier to kind of move them to the left and right. We're going to initialize an i and j pointer. The i is going to be, I say front plus one, we're going to need it to be the one spot right after the pivot, and j is going to go at the back of our array. Now implementation wise, back might be an exclusive bound, so it might need to be back minus one. That's really just an implementation detail, I just wanted to call attention to that one. And then we're going to kind of do these three uh, steps, that's these three steps, let me kind of indicate it's only those three. These three steps until our i and j pointers have crossed each other. And in this uh, instance, cross means that like completely past each other. If they're equal, we don't consider that crossing yet. What we're going to do is our i pointer is going to look for elements that are greater than the pivot because i starts on the left and we don't want elements greater than the pivot on the left of our array. Right? We want them on the right. J is going to move to try to find an element that's smaller than the pivot because J starts on the right and we, want, we don't want smaller elements on the right. So we're going to keep having them move until they find elements that are respectively bigger and smaller than the pivot. Once they've done that, we're going to swap those two. That will take our small element that J has found and move it to the left and our large element that I has found and move it to the right. Once we've done that, uh, I can also kind of add one other step here. We can immediately increment i and decrement j. That's just because we've already checked those two spots. There's no reason to check them again. That just kind of reduces by two comparisons. Then once we've done all of these spots, once we've done all of these uh, steps and our i and j pointers have crossed, that guarantees that we have found the correct position for the pivot to be in. And in this instance, that correct position is going to be index j. And once we do this, we're just going to swap the pivot to index j. That's a j right there, in case you can't see very well. Uh, we're moving it to index j, and that will put our pivot in the exact correct position. Now, 
This is kind of the one difference between quick sort and quick select. With quick select, we then checked what J was, saw if we were done or not, and recurse to one side. But in quick sort, we want the entire array to be sorted, which means we need to recurse on both sides of the pivot. And once we recurse on both sides of the pivot, that guarantees that we're going to sort our entire array. Now we need a base case for this because we are doing recursion, and we kind of have two base cases here size 1 or size 0 subarrays. Now you won't have encountered size 0 subarrays on your homework because you're looking for a very specific index that's kind of guaranteed to be there. But it is possible to have a size 0 subarray in quick sort because you might have j end up at 0, in which case your, left, your right subarray is everything after it and your left subarray is nothing. So in the case that you reach a size 0 or size 1 subarray, you kind of just stop your recursion and don't go any further. So I'm going to kind of do one run through of the partition algorithm on the board, and then I'm going to turn it over to the visualization tool, and we're going to run kind of through the rest of QuickSort a little bit faster, because uh, you guys have seen this algorithm a couple times. You've implemented it in code. It's just a matter of how many times the algorithm is running is the one difference. So this is the array we're going to start with. Uh, you'll notice I've selected the element at the beginning of our array as my pivot already. It's just one less swap I have to do, because I don't need to swap it to the beginning. So now we need our i and j pointers. Again, we want i to be that first element after the pivot, and we want j to be that last element at the end of our array. We also want my camera to focus. It looks a little better. And now we're going to start moving i and j. So again, i wants to find an element that's bigger than the pivot. So 1 is not bigger than the pivot, so i moves forward by 1. I see a question. What do you do if I don't find array i and array j? If my i becomes greater than j? OK, yes. So let me go back to this algorithm. So it is possible that during either of these steps, i and j do cross. If i and j ever cross during any of these three steps, really these two, uh, we immediately stop. So once i and j have crossed, we immediately move on to this fourth step down here of swapping array j with the pivot. It's very possible that, say we're dealing with like a really sorted array already, that there's no out of place elements and we just have to do this swap immediately. And I think one of the examples on the viz tool will show that. If it's not, I can kind of write my own example. But that's a great question. So we moved i forward by one, and now i has found an element bigger than the pivot. So i is going to stop moving. J wants to find an element that's smaller than the pivot. So right now it's at 5. That's not smaller. We move it backwards by 1, and we reach 2. 2 is an element that's smaller than their pivot, so we can swap these two. It's swapping 6 and swapping 2. And you notice that's going to put the 6 to the right side of our array, because it's bigger than 3, and the 2 to our left side of our array. So now, let's hope I don't run out of room. 2 here, 4, 0, 8, 6, 5. And now we move j down by 1 and i up by 1 preemptively, because we know that the 6 and 2 are already in their correct order. There's no reason to check them again. So again, i wants to find an element that's bigger than the pivot. 4 is bigger than 3, so we stop that automatically. j wants to find an element smaller than the pivot. 8's not smaller, so we're going to move down by 1. And now we reach 0. 0 is an element that's smaller than our pivot, so i and j have both stopped. They haven't crossed yet, so we're going to swap them. And where does that leave us? Now we have 3, 1, 2, 0, 4, 8, 6, 5. And our i and j move one spot forward and backwards respectively and now they end up here now i and j have crossed each other you notice this is at the very start of kind of those three steps earlier so we're not going to try to move i and j forward at all we're actually not going to do any comparisons it's very important that as soon as i and j cross you don't try to do any element comparisons you stop immediately and that's because it's actually possible for i to go out of bounds of the array. It's perfectly acceptable for it to do that. You just need to make sure that you're not comparing that element. So as soon as i and j cross, we stop, and we're going to swap our pivot with j, which is right here at this 0.
Now we end up with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 6, and 5. And I'm going to circle 3 here, because 3 was our pivot. So we now know that 3 is in its exact correct position. This is index kind of 2 of the array. Uh, index 3 of the array, sorry. Um, so even if the rest of the array was sorted, we know 3 will not move. 3 is in its right position. So if we want to completely sort this array, we're going to kind of recursively call quick sort twice. Once on this left subarray is 0, 1, 2. It happens to be sorted, uh, but we're still, we don't inherently know that. And then we're going to call quick sort on the right side of our array, this 4, 8, 6, 5. Those two will run their instances, they will sort themselves, and we will be left with an entirely sorted array. And it would be a lot to write that on the board, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to the viz tool, and we will go ahead and see how that looks. So I've got the viz tool pulled up right now. Hopefully you guys can still hear me fine. This is basically the same array we had earlier. The viz tool has a couple issues with uh, zero, so I had to move up the elements a little by one. This first iteration you'll see will play out kind of exactly the same way uh, the other one did. I see a question. Can I use negative numbers and integer dot min value or max value in quick sort, quick select? Yes. So since uh, quick sort and quick select aren't inherently uh, number based like LSD radix sort was, so there is absolutely no issue with using max value, min value, nothing like that. We're just using comparisons, not any kind of absolute value or anything. So we're going to have exactly zero issues by using those kind of outlier values. Now let's see how this looks. So I'm going to play this. It's going to go a little fast. I'll pause it if stuff gets a little weird. We choose our pivot. We're going to move our I pointer and our J pointer. We swap them. We do that same move again. And now these two are going to cross each other just like they did before. And we're going to swap our pivot with index J. So you'll notice we're using yellow here to indicate our pivot and these two circles to indicate our i and j pointers. So this swaps and now we have these two subarrays that we're going to need to sort. So we start on this left side of our array. We choose one as the pivot. This uh, quick sort in this case is just choosing the first element as the pivot every time to make it easier. It's one less swap we have to do. Uh, choosing randomly works a little bit better but this kind of gives me a consistent example. So now what's going to happen is since i since j is looking for an element smaller than the pivot we're going to see it moves to 2 now this isn't crossing yet because they're on the same spot and then j moves to index 0 so now i and j have crossed and you'll note that j is at the exact index that our pivot is so one is kind of going to swap with itself in this case and we know it's completely sorted this is where we get that size 0 subarray i talked about before because in this case, our left subarray is nothing, and our right subarray is this 2 and 3. So we keep moving forward by a bit. We're going to get the exact same thing here, where j swaps with itself. We reach that size 1 subarray case with 3, so it, nothing happens there. And now let's see what happens here. It's going to kind of be the same thing, where j moves all the way down, and 5 swaps with itself. And now we have a case where we're going to choose the pivot as the largest thing in the subarray. And this is where we're going to see that i going out of bounds I talked about earlier. So in this case, i went one spot out of bounds. And we, this is why it's really important to not do any comparisons before we check if i and j have crossed each other. Step one spot backwards. So this is right before we swapped with our pivot. i and j have crossed. We don't compare index i to the pivot we just immediately swap the pivot with index j. So this is kind of the question people were, someone asked earlier about what if we never find things to swap with? That's fine. Quick sort works perfectly acceptable. We're just going to swap the pivot to index j wherever index j happens to be. It's not possible for index j to go out of bounds because if index j goes down as far as it can go, it'll hit the pivot, but i will go out of bounds. So it's very important uh, that you swap with j and not i. So we now know 8's in the correct position, so we're going to have this size 2 subarray that we run quick sort on. It's going to be the exact same before, where 6 swaps with itself, and then we have a size 1 case with 7, which is done. So now we've completely run quick sort, and our array is completely sorted. You can run through this yourself and see how things look. Uh, if you want, you can pick the min element as the pivot or the first element. If you uncheck it, I believe it just picks randomly. And now I'm going to go ahead and back to this. 
we can talk a little bit about efficiency. I have some room on the bottom. So our worst case for a quick sort is going to be if we always choose the smallest element or the biggest element every time. Because if you think about how the algorithm works, if I choose the smallest element, I'm going to iterate over the rest of the array looking for an element that's smaller than it, not find one, and swap it with itself. Now that sounds a lot like an algorithm we talked about earlier. It's almost exactly the same as selection sort. And if we repeat that process over and over and over again, quick sort can potentially be as bad as selection sort if we choose really bad pivots. We remember that selection sort is O of n squared. So our worst case for quick sort is going to be O of n squared. Um, what about best and average case? Now, best and average case are a little unintuitive, and generally other classes will talk a little bit more about where these cases come from. But we're kind of doing really similar splitting like we did in merge sort. If we think about the partition algorithm, partition always goes across the entire subarray that you're dealing with. So even when we split down the middle, our next iteration of partition that we perform on this side and the partition that we perform on this side is kind of a total of O of n work. So it's really similar to merge sort, where we have all of that splitting that goes down, and every level is O of n work. And since we're splitting in half every time if we choose a good pivot, as long as we keep choosing good pivots, which are roughly in the middle of our array, we will get that uh, just like just like merge sort, we will get that O of n log n. Is that visible? Yeah. So that's going to be our best or average case. Is that, and that's going to be when we choose pivots that are roughly in the middle of our array. And if you think about it, we don't necessarily need to choose the median every single time for a good pivot. We actually consider pretty good pivots to be anything kind of in the middle 50 percent, uh, 50 percentile of our array, so 20, the first quartile to the third quartile, and that's half of our array we can choose from. So every two iterations, we're probably going to have picked a good pivot on one of them. So this does happen on average. In order for this to be the worst case, you're looking at what an O of n factorial, a one over n factorial chance to choose the smallest element every time. So you're really not going to get the selection sort case that often. So quick sort is a pretty good algorithm. It's quick, that's where the name comes from. Usually performing an n log n time to sort the entire array. Now, a little bit about some of the other properties. You'll notice we are doing these kind of long swaps across the whole array. And just like in selection sort, that's kind of a good indication that we're dealing with a non-stable sort, an unstable sort, because any of these long swaps might move duplicates past each other. So we can't guarantee that duplicates will remain in the right position, so we do call this an unstable sort. But unlike merge sort, we aren't actually making new subarrays to perform this algorithm in. You'll notice in that VizTool example I did, all of that work was done in one array. We never actually had to make a new array to do any of the swapping. So this is an in-place algorithm, even though we're kind of doing these subarrays. These subarrays are just imaginary subarrays. They don't really exist. You'll notice on your homework, you made a helper method that took in those indices, and that's how we handled that in-place quality. Now, adaptable. Uh, you can see there's absolutely no work being done here to guarantee that we have a that we, if we start with a sorted array, it's any better. You actually think if we have a sorted array and we pick the smallest element, the first element every time, that's actually going to be our worst case. So sorted arrays can actually be really bad for a quick sort sometimes. But in general, it is not an adaptable sort. I see a question. Why do we want to choose the pivot in the middle 50%? Didn't he choose the first element of the array? So, okay, uh, this is... A little bit of my bad. When I say middle 50% of the array, I mean in terms of like the values. So the middle 50% of this array means I want, ideally I want to choose like three, four, five as my pivot. That would be ideal. But I have no way of knowing that. I can't possibly know what the median or middle values of my array will be before I sort it. So that's just kind of a naive hope that I choose that. When I say choose the first element in the array, that's whatever's at index zero. Because we have no guarantee of what indexes might be anywhere. So index zero is kind of as likely to be the median of the array as any other spot. So choosing a random element is completely random. There's no reason for that element to be anything we want, but we ideally would choose something close to the median, and that median could be anywhere. Great question. 
Um, another question, would selecting end minus start over two as a pivot instead of randomly generating one affect the efficiency at all? No. So what kind of, what pivot we choose because the element, we just kind of assume that everything is randomly sorted. Um, what pivot we choose doesn't really affect our efficiency at all unless we're intentionally choosing the worst possible pivots, which is the smallest elements of the array or the largest elements of the array. Uh, the issues that you could have with choosing n minus start over 2 is that if someone's adversarially creating the array, which means they're creating the array that's the worst possible array for your sort, they can create an array that will give you O of n squared efficiency. But by choosing randomly, the only way for us to get this O of n squared is if we get unreasonably unlucky. Like, the chances that you'll actually get O of n squared by choosing random pivots is incredibly low. So choosing random pivots is pretty good. Choosing deterministically is fine. If you don't have access to a random number generator, you can pick whatever pivots you want. It's a little easier to choose the first element of the array because it's one less swap you have to do, but you can choose the middle element. There's no real difference, uh, but it does not impact your efficiency at all, no. Great question. I will wait a little bit in case there are more questions that are going to be asked, and then I'll talk a little bit more about heap sort. Also, since it looks like we are going to have plenty of time after this, feel free that if you have other topics that you think would be really useful for me to cover right now that are related to sorting or other things in the course, or just general questions, I can answer those, because I'm only going to spend a few minutes on heap sort because you have actually seen it before. So we'll have plenty of time. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions about quick sort. I'll go ahead and mark that one off, and now we'll move into heap sort. Now, heap sort, uh, you remember that we do actually have an animation that I made for it, so I'll go ahead and play the relevant part of that. That animation does show off kind of both sides of both parts of heap sort, but the one that's relevant for your homework is that out of place heap sort. You remember how that works is we take all of our elements, put them into a min heap, which is a priority queue in Java. And then we can keep dequeuing those elements into our array until we reach all of the elements in our array being in their correct sorted order. We do use an external heap to do this. Now in terms of kind of this basic structure, that means just taking our array, this, I kind of ran out of space, it's just java.util.priority queue. It's backed entirely by a min heap. We take the array, put it into there. There's a collection constructor of this priority queue, which performs the build heap algorithm. We just shove all of our elements into this priority queue, and then we can keep calling the remove operation repeatedly to put elements in every single spot of our array in order, starting from the beginning, moving to the end. And once we've done that, we will end up with a sorted array. There are other variants of heap sort that I uh, talk about in that animation. And you can see a little bit more about that, but the only one that's relevant for your homework is this out of place variant. It's a very short method. It shouldn't be more than like five lines or so, um, but it's that. Uh, question, is there any chance I can go over LSD rate sort again? Yes, I will. I can get to that. I'm probably not going to go into it as in depth as we did last week, but I will try to talk about kind of the key points. But heap sort overall, a pretty straightforward algorithm in terms of efficiencies. Now we kind of have two parts of the efficiency of heap sort. We have this step of putting everything into the priority queue and this step of removing everything. Now I mentioned that the collection constructor of the priority queue uses the build heap algorithm. And you'll remember that's O of n. And but these remove operations removed from a heap is an O of log n operation. And since we have to do that operation n times, that's where we kind of get an n, an n log n. And since that's a much bigger term than O of n, this is where the efficiency of heap sort comes from, is this n log n. That's the same best worst average case. There is no difference because it's always just performing these remove operations. 
You also remember you didn't really handle duplicates at all in your heaps. There's no kind of defined way of doing that. So it is an unstable algorithm. It's R variant is out of place because we're using an external heap to do it. And there's nothing adaptable about this algorithm. It is n log n always. So if there's any questions about that, you can ask them, but I'm gonna start talking about uh, LSD radix sort a bit. I'm gonna kind of do a brief overview of kind of how the algorithm works and what everything looks like. So LSD radix sort is all about taking numbers and sorting them based on their digits. So let me you know, kind of ignore this array. Let me get myself some numbers to work with. And I'm going to only use positive numbers uh, just because I don't really have enough room on this paper to write out buckets involving negative numbers. So hopefully you'll be able to kind of get the idea of how everything works. So these are the elements I'm going to be sorting. Uh, I'm going to put in some commas to help differentiate where one element starts and the next begins. Hopefully that is useful. Uh, that 20 is getting cut off a little bit on the right. It's just a 20. There's nothing after it. I'll try to shift things a little bit to the left. So how radix sort works is the first step we're doing is we want to sort these elements by the smallest digit first which means that we have all of our buckets, which I will write down here. In this case, since there's only positive numbers, our buckets go zero through nine. If we had negative numbers in our array, we would start at negative nine and go negative nine, negative eight, negative seven, etc., to zero up to nine. So that would be 19 buckets instead of the 10 we have here. And all of these buckets need to be first in, first out. They need to be queues. And in Java, we can implement that with a linked list. So in general, this is just an array of linked lists. That's how you can implement it in your code. Now we need to take these elements and put them into the buckets. The first pass is going to be putting every element in a bucket based on its ones digit. So 21 has a ones digit of one. So it's going to go in the one bucket. 343 will go in the three bucket. Seven goes in the seven bucket. 81 is going to go in the one bucket. I'm going to put it below 21 because it's going to be a first in, first out. So 21 was the first thing. 17 is going to go right here below 7. 153 right here. 841. And 20 will go in the zero bucket. Now, when I empty these buckets, how that's going to work is I iterate over all the buckets, starting in this case with the zero bucket. If I had negative numbers, I'd start with the negative nine bucket. And every time I get to a bucket, if that has any elements in it, I'm going to dequeue them in the order they're in the buckets straight into my array. So I start at zero and I dequeue 20. And then I go at one and I'm gonna put 21, then 81, then 841. There's nothing in the two bucket, so I skip it. The three bucket has 343 and 153. Four bucket has nothing, same with the five and six. 7 bucket, I DQ 7, 7 and 17, and there's nothing in the 8 and 9 bucket. So this is the, after one iteration of LSD radix sort, all of my elements are sorted by their least significant digit. So they're sorted by their ones place. But I obviously have to do more iterations than one. LSD radix sort needs to do as many iterations as the longest, not largest, longest number in your array. And in this case, my longest numbers are these three three-digit numbers right here. So I'm going to need to do three iterations of radix sort. Now, the reason I say longest number specifically is because if I have negative numbers, sorry, if I have negative numbers in my array, it's possible that I have a really long negative number, and that's going to determine the number of iterations I need to do. So now I'm going to kind of cross through these elements so that we know I'm ignoring them. And we'll start putting elements in buckets again. So 20 and 21, now we're doing tens digit. Because this is the second iteration that's kind of the second digit. 20 is going to go in the two bucket. 21 is also going to go in the two bucket. 81 in the eight bucket. 
841 in the 4 bucket, 343 in the 4 bucket, 153 in the 5 bucket, 7 is going to go in the 0 bucket because there's no, it's kind of, you can think of it as 0, 0, 7 instead of just the 7. It's going to go in the 0 bucket. Remember, 20 is not there anymore. I just can't erase this because it's a marker. And 17 is going to go in the 1 bucket. So now we do, that's the first part of our second iteration. We've populated the buckets. Now we're going to need to empty the buckets again. So we start with the 0 bucket, 7. The one bucket only has a 17 in it. The two bucket has a 20 and a 21. We're going to DQ those in order. 20 first, then 21. Nothing in the three bucket. Four bucket has two things, 841 and 343. Five bucket just has 153. Nothing in the six bucket. Nothing in the seven bucket. Eight bucket has 81. And there's nothing in the 9 bucket. So after two iterations of the array, now if you think about it, if we ignore the hundreds digit in these numbers, so if we ignore this 8, 3, and 1 right here, we have a completely sorted array. Everything else is in its right position. It's just these hundreds digits that are going to be messing us up. So with that said, we're going to do one final iteration of radix sort with the hundreds digit, that third digit for a third iteration. And after that, we should be left with a completely sorted array. So, all of these things that don't have things in the hundreds place, they're just going to go in the zero bucket. Uh, I kind of have room for new buckets here. I'm going to actually rewrite them. Because those were getting a little cluttered. So, 7, 17, 20, and 21 all go in the zero bucket. 841 is going to go in the eight bucket. 343 in the three bucket. 153 in the 1 bucket, and 81 also in the 0 bucket. So now we have our elements in the buckets, and we can DQ them again. The 0 bucket, everything's going to come right out in that order. 7, 17, 20, 21, 81. In the 1 bucket, we have 153. In the 3 bucket, we have 343. Nothing in the 4, 5, 6, or 7 bucket, and in the 8 bucket we have 841. Nothing in the 9 bucket, and now our entire array is sorted, and we are done with radix sort. Now, some important notes is that I'm kind of always emptying stuff back into the same array I started in. So this array, the elements in it moved around, but I didn't make a new array every time. Similarly, I can actually reuse the buckets as long as I'm taking the things out of them, I don't need to kind of reinstantiate all the buckets every single time. It's just the elements are kind of moving back and forth between the buckets and the array. So every iteration of radix sort is take the elements, put them in the buckets, and then take the elements out of the buckets and put them back into the array. So you're going to have those two loops alternating between them, and that will be your iteration. Uh, question, how to find the largest number in LSD radix? So remember, we actually want the longest number, not the largest number. We want the most amount of digits. Now, we actually had to kind of solve a similar problem in selection sort, where we needed to figure out what the largest or smallest number of the array is. So what we can do is we can iterate over our array before we start the sort, and we can keep track of what our largest absolute value of a number is. So let me if I have let's write out an array that has like some negative numbers in it so uh, negative 21 5 86 43 negative negative 5001 and 2 so how we can start in this is we start with our first number and we say this absolute value is 21. Not negative 21, the absolute value is 21. It's a little out of focus. Then we get to 5. Now 5 is larger than 21, but it is not larger than the absolute value of 21. So we keep our pointer at 21. Then we get to 86. 86 is bigger than the absolute value of 21, so now 86 is our biggest. 243 is bigger than 86. And when we get to here to negative 5001, 
negative 5001 is larger in absolute value than 243. So we store this as our largest number, and obviously 2 isn't bigger than 5001. So we've determined that five, negative 5001 is our longest number. And in order to get the number of digits, we can just repeatedly divide by 10, and the number of divisions by 10 it takes us to reach down to 0 will be the number of digits our number has. Now an important detail is uh, if any of these numbers are integer.min value, you need to have a very explicit check for if it's integer.min value, because integer.min value is guaranteed to be longer than any number in your array or equal length. But if you take the absolute value of integer.min value, you will get back a negative number. The absolute value of integer.min value is itself. So you need to be careful not to take the absolute value specifically if the number in the array is exactly equal to integer.min value. And that is an, a hard edge case you need to write. There's really no way around it. Uh, I see another question. Could I implement LSD radix sort this way? Could I make the number of iterations one more than my second largest number? If I have one more number that has way more digits than everything else, doesn't it waste time to keep iterating through it over and over again when you know that's the longest number? So the issue is you may know it's the longest number, but you don't necessarily... Uh, you might have like two numbers that are the longest number. In that case, you need to like figure out uh, what their relative positions are. Maybe you have three numbers that are the longest out of like 500 other numbers. So we're just kind of going down a rabbit hole of maybe you're fixing one very specific case of LSD radix sort, but you're not really going to improve the algorithm in general because you will still need to figure out somehow where that element goes. Because you're not just going to be able to stop after that iteration because Say that your numbers are, uh, I have some room to write down here. Say that your numbers are like uh, 3, 5, 7, and like, what, 600,000 in 1. After three iterations of my sort, after any number of iterations other than six iterations of my sort, I will still have the 600,001 at the beginning of my array. These are four elements. So I need to do all six iterations in order to figure out where this number goes or write some weird hard-coded edge case. So I can't necessarily do that optimization you're talking about, although it is a really good idea and I wish it worked, but unfortunately it does not. Great question. Uh, any other questions about rate extort or other stuff that you want me to talk about? Because we do have 13 or so more minutes and I can probably talk about one more thing if I need to. Uh, are we required to use integer.min value in the LST rate extort method? So you, there's really no way around edge, there's very few ways around edge casing it. Um, if you did the reality check, I believe reality check 20, I could, that sounds right. Uh, it's the advanced sort coding one. There is kind of a different method of determining your stopping condition for rate extort and that can potentially avoid the edge case of integer.min value, but that has its own edge cases of integer overflow, which you may encounter if you implement them that way. So it's possible to avoid using it, but it definitely if you're implementing it in the way I talked about where you're just determining the largest absolute value, you should edge case integer.min value. That will be just hard coded into your code. There's not a lot of ways around it. Great question. At this point, I will sit around and wait a couple of minutes if there's any other final questions or things people want me to talk about. Otherwise, I will cut the stream and we will be back at 6 p.m. for Landon's recitation covering roughly the same things I talked about.
Uh, could we go over heap sort diagramming briefly? So we're not going to ask you to diagram the in place version of heap sort that you saw in the uh, video. If you want to see that example, you can watch that video I posted and see it. Um, but since we're only really using the out of place version in this course for right now, the diagramming is basically just sorting the array. There isn't really any other steps that you need to worry about because we don't worry about any of the behind the scenes behind the scenes stuff that goes on inside the min heap. Uh, integer.min value and integer.max value, what are these used for with LSD rate sort? Why wouldn't someone just use the absolute value? So this kind of involves um, out of, if you'll give me a second. This kind of involves a weird thing. You'll talk about it a little bit more in other classes like CS2110, but uh, the integer numbers go from negative 2 to the 31 all the way up to positive 2 to the 31 minus 1. This is min value. This is max value. So in theory, the absolute value of min value would be equal to max plus 1. But max is the largest value we can possibly have in an integer. So if we take the absolute value of min value, we get to max, we add one, and it kind of wraps all the way back around, and we actually get that the absolute value of min is equal to min. And just to stress this, that is less than zero. So in your code, you would have something like, uh, say you have like min value, which I'm not gonna write because it's two to the 31, which is a very long number, it's like in the realm of like a billion or so, you would actually find that the, inter the absolute value of min value is like less than the absolute value of like 23, for example. And that is very much not the behavior you're intending. So you do need to hard code the integer.min value case. You don't need to hard code the integer.max value case because the absolute value of max is itself. It's still a positive number. So that's perfectly fine. The issue is min value. You'll have this weird thing and you do need to handle that. Um, could we talk about the difference between in place version of quicksort and the out of place version of quicksort? We're not gonna talk about out of place quicksort at all in this class. Um, if you're curious about out of place quicksort or like other weird variants of any sort we talk about, uh, you are free to look those up on your own. But for this, the sake of this class, we are only gonna talk about in place quicksort. Great questions though. And I will give another minute or so for people to ask more questions or if people need follow-ups to any of the stuff I just answered. Uh, do we need to write a helper method for any of the sorting methods? So, um, do you need to? Technically, yes. So for your homework at the very least for case select, since that's a recursive method that we, I talked about you need those extra bounds for, since we're not actually creating new arrays, you will need a helper method to do your quick select, or if you were writing quick sort, you would need a helper method for that, uh, because you need to make a method that takes in the bounds that you're operating on. For any of the other sorting methods, you do not need a helper. We recommend writing a swap helper method because it's you have to do a lot of swaps in this homework, and having a swap helper method makes it a little bit faster um, it just makes the code a little bit cleaner. A lot of people tend to write helper methods for doing the merge part of merge sort. That's not required. You can write it in the merge sort method and that's acceptable. Um, radix sort, it's really uncommon for people to write helper methods for radix sort, but you can. Um, another question, how would we handle integer overflow in the LSD radix core method shown in reality check 30, 30, sorry, not 20. In other words, how would we handle the edge case for this method implementation differ from the integer.min value case for the other way to code LC rate sort with the initial pass through? Uh, by far the easiest method for, so where the overflow occurs, I should explain that, is in rate sort we recommend having this like divisor variable that you initialize to one and then at the end every iteration you do divisor times equals 10. And the issue is in rate sort uh, if you're doing the implementation we show in reality check 30, this will eventually overflow. 
And the easiest way to fix this by far is just to initialize it to a long instead of an int. And if you initialize it to a long, that will fix your overflow issue because your array only holds ints and you're not going to have any numbers that will overflow along. There are other ways to fix it. You could hard cap the uh, maximum iterations that you do in radix sort. You could have some checks for if you were about to overflow this value, but this is by far the easiest way to do it. Great questions though. I'm still a little lost about integer drop min value. How and why should we use it? I thought comparing the absolute value of each element can help us find the longest value. So the important thing is that uh, we say our array has like these elements in it. Say we have like three, four, six, 22, and min value. So the longest element in this array is definitely min value by far. It's a lot of digits. I think it's like 13 digits long. But if you only compare the absolute values of elements using Java's math.absolute value, you will see that the largest absolute value in the array is 22. And the reason for that is because, as I discussed up here, the absolute value of integer.min value is a negative number. And absolute value is supposed to give us a positive number. But the issue is that Java doesn't have a positive integer that's capable of representing uh, integer.min value's absolute value. So the only thing it can really give you is integer.min value itself. So you have to hard code. So like earlier when I was checking like, okay, three is the smallest, four is bigger than it, six is bigger than it. My actual check should be something like this. Three is my smallest number. 4 is not integer.min value and it is bigger than 3. 6 is not integer.min value and it is bigger than 4. 22 is not integer.min value and it is bigger than 6. This is min integer.min value, so this is the longest number in my array. You can actually write a hard coded case to stop immediately if you find this, because it's not possible for any number to be longer than integer.min value. I've even seen people hard code the number of digits this has, and that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, what is a real world example of a situation where quick sort is used over other sorting algorithms? So quick sort is just a fast in place sorting algorithm. So it's actually really useful. Uh, a lot of basic implementations in programming languages do use quick sort as their basic sorting method. Uh, oh, another question. I will get to that in a second. But quick sort is a really useful algorithm. If you don't have a lot of memory or you don't use a lot of extra memory, um, you can use quick sort and that will sort your array in n log n time on average. Remember that O of n squared time basically never happens. So you can get that n log n sort time without using any extra memory. It's very useful. Uh, I saw a question about the recitation worksheets. I forgot to get to that earlier. So uh, recitation worksheets, you'll notice I didn't have any links to it. That's because we're going to start posting them on Canvas. You'll be able to find them in the recitation folder on Canvas. If this week's isn't there already, we'll make sure it gets posted there right after. Uh, I'm done talking to you. Uh, we will also be posting the solutions. When we post the topic list for exam three, so that's that one week before exam three, we will upload all of the solutions to the recitation worksheets to Canvas, to the recitation folder. Um, and you'll be able to find them there. That one recitation right before the exam will upload the solutions to you immediately. Uh, could I repeat what I talked about? LXD sort when dealing with negative numbers. So the big things with negative numbers is that you have 19 buckets instead of 10 because you have buckets for negative nine, is that off screen that is, uh, because you'll have buckets for negative nine, negative eight, all the way up to zero, and then one, two, all the way up to nine. So you'll have 19 buckets in total, and this just means that negative numbers go in their corresponding negative bucket instead of their positive bucket. And then you have this integer.min value case, which I've talked about a, lo a lot at this point. Uh, but that is basically all the time we have today. Um, go back to this. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out to this. I hope that this was useful. I hope that it was nice to kind of have a TA talking to you and answering questions. We will be doing this every week, hopefully right here. And we'll release announcements when stuff change. Uh, I'm about to cut this off and then at six o'clock, we'll come back with our second part of the recita our second recitation. It'll cover the same stuff I talked about earlier, so don't worry about watching both. You really only need to see one, and that can get all your information in. But thank you guys so much for this. 
It's been a great week, and I will see you guys next week. Thank you.